If it is the philosophy of fair chase that we're discussing, I would make the argument that hound hunting is the greatest of all fair chase methods. It's the only method where the game being pursued is fully aware from beginning to end that he's being hunted. He's not a buck mindlessly chasing a doe to breed half out of his head with lust. He's not an elk being dropped from 500 yards away by a bullet he has no sense of coming. He's not a boar being ambushed from above entirely unaware of his enemy. Once a game animal, here's the hounds he's fully aware. All his senses are in play. The terrain is his home and he holds all the cards. And often he uses these things to escape. I'm not against other methodologies. I support other types of hunters. Just don't tell me that hound hunting isn't ethical or fair chase. That, my friends, is a pearl of wisdom from my good friend T.L. Jones of Houston Valley Plots. I know T.L. is Tracy. He's been to my house. He's stayed at my house. I've hunted with him and his family and friends in eastern Tennessee. I've known Tracy for a long time, and I would encourage you to follow him on social media. Also, you can pick up more of his wisdom by reading his column. When you subscribe to Bear Hunting Magazine, then you'll get his column. And he has uh, come up with a pretty nice hashtag, which is Sacred Pursuit. TL made that post on December 17th, 2022 on his Facebook page. It's been shared wildly by houndsmen thousands of times now. And that post energized me to follow up on an interview that I should have done a year ago. And uh, we're going to talk about Fair Chase, and we're going to the root of Fair Chase. We're going to get some history on what that term means, where it originated from, how time, technology, and different things have affected and influenced what Fair Chase actually is, and how we as hunters need to take back control of the narrative on what fair chase is it's something that deeply affects us as houndsmen and something that is often mischaracterized and defined poorly by the enemies that we have that want to take away our abilities to free cast hounds so i got on the horn and interviewed Justin Spring at the Boone and Crockett Club, and we take a pretty deep dive into the Boone and Crockett Club, the impact they have had on wildlife management in North America, why they were so influential uh, in the beginning for wildlife restoration in North America. We talk about what role they play in the 21st century for wildlife management, and we take a deep dive into their controversial position on the use of GPS tracking equipment and the use of hounds and how that affects entries into Boone and Crockett and how it affects us as houndsmen. This is one of those houndsman XP exclusive topics that deals with the intricate parts of our lifestyle and how we need to be informed and understand the world around us and what is really affecting us as houndsmen. If you're looking for entertainment, this podcast is probably not for you. If you are serious about hunting well into the future, if you are serious about preserve, protect, and promote this lifestyle, you need to listen to this podcast. There are individuals and organizations out there working hard every day, to take away your freedoms. They are not sitting back looking for funny stories to tell. They're looking for hard information to use against you. So do yourself a favor. Stay tuned for this podcast. Listen all the way through. Pick up the things we talk about when we when we talk about how we talk about hunting, about getting control of the narrative again. Um, knowing how the Boone and Crockett Club and their opinion affects you as a houndsman. 
This is important stuff when wildlife managers are faced with issues about hunting with hounds. They look to groups like the Boone and Crockett Club for definitions on what fair chase is. This one is definitely a box shaker, folks. This is a big, mean one. We're going to need our best hounds for this one. They're going to have to be tough. They're going to have to be gritty. They're going to have to be smart. Let's get the tailgate down. It's time to dump the box. Yeah, so you guys are based out of out of Missoula, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we got Justin Spring with the Boone and Crockett Club on the podcast with us. And uh, Justin, it's a real honor to have you on here and uh, just spend some time with us today. And, and uh, we're going to talk about things, all things about Fair Chase. We're going to talk about the origins. We're going to talk about the history of the Boone and Crockett Club. Uh, we're going to talk about the opinion that Boone and Crockett has put out about GPS collars and trackers and get some clarity on that. And, uh, welcome, welcome, Justin. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. Appreciate having me on. Yeah. So why don't we just start with a, uh, let's start with a, a history of the Boone and Crockett club in today's day and age. Uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, we've lost some of our history. Americans are terrible about historical historical things and and just as a general population we rank probably with lowest in the world on even knowing our history and and one of the most important things with wildlife history and hunting history was are things like the restoration act and and different things like that and and uh which is Pittman robertson fund and stuff like that but but anyway boone and crockett was in this game a long time before that happened so I'm just going to give you the mic and let you give us a history lesson on Boone and Cro- what the Boone and Crockett Club is, and uh, just go with it, man. All right. So, I mean, our our founding was um, 1887. Theodore Roosevelt had been out west. He, he'd done his ranching in the Dakotas, had that failure, um, done some hunting, and it seemed that the the wildlife populations were at an all time low. Um, he'd written a book about his experiences in the west. The editor of uh, um, oh Forest and Stream, which becomes Field and Stream at the time, wrote a review. Um, he didn't uh, didn't agree with um, basically the Roosevelt didn't agree with the editor's. Uh, sorry, we got some technical difficulties. Oh, that's here. all right. Just just roll with it, man. We can we can uh, deal with it. <clears throat> Anyway, so they, uh, Roosevelt, George Bergernell, who was the editor of uh, Forest and Stream at the time, kind of met and they saw within each other what, you know, what the conservation movement needed to save wildlife. Grinnell was a very educated man, but was, was much happier in the background where Roosevelt was the guy that would be out front, you know, pounding, the, pounding his chest and giving speeches and whatnot. So that was our founding. Um, they got together a bunch of influential member or influential folks industrialists, um, military guys, and they basically said, we got to do something about um, wildlife, you know, decline. And that was the starting of Boone and Crockett. And so. Yeah. And just um, kind of paint, just kind of paint a picture for us, what wildlife populations were like all across the United but, States in the 1870s. You know, it was, I mean, it was, it, it's even hard to imagine now, you know, there was no beavers east of the Mississippi river. Um, you know, bison were, were pretty much gone. There was there was elk only in a few places in Colorado and, and a, some remnant elk populations in the northwest. Um, you know, it was it was dismal. There was bison, but they were very, very limited um, on where they were. You know, they they'd captured a few of the last bison about that time and take them to the Bronx Zoo, thinking that those were the last to re, you know, basically rebuild the population. That's another interesting thing. The National Bison Range, the club started, um, was supposed to be the seed population to bring back all bison. And that still is, you know, oh, about an hour north of our headquarters here in Missoula. There still is the National Bison Range. But in any case, they uh, what they did is they said, you know, we, we need to change the topic, you know, change the way the wildlife is viewed. It's not an inexhaustible resource. Um, you know, market hunting gets a lot of heat, but at the time, 
you know, what they referred to as pot hunters were just as bad people that would just shoot whatever it was with no regard for the overall species. And, you know, everybody, like I said, market hunting had a bad name where they were selling hides and everything. Right. And, and But, you know, the, the people just shooting whatever they saw to eat and feed themselves were just, just as to blame for the, the decline. And so it, the, the, it, the it's an it's an amazing thing to me. I hate to jump in there. I, did, I just had this thought and if I don't, if I don't jump in, then I'll, I'll, I'll lose the thought, but to think that what year was the Lewis and Clark expedition in the great Northwest? Was that in the 18, you know, early 1800s, 1810, 13, yeah. that. Oh, and, should I know that that's in my history presentation and I have a slide <laughs> that there, called off the top of my head, you know, and, and they're, they're documenting like herds of Buffalo that look like ants on the landscape and different things. And by 18, the 1870s, they're almost gone to the right. point where we're putting them in zoos. It's right. a, it's hard to imagine, you know, the impact that we had on wildlife in that short of amount of time. Yeah, no, and and you know, like I said, they they, they needed to change the the public you know opinion of hunting that had to be you know sustainable for it to continue. And then you know, secondly, we had a national park. Yellowstone had been set aside, but there was zero enforcement, so there was still timber extraction going on. There was poaching. And so the first thing the club did was basically build some stronger laws through Congress to protect Yellowstone. Like I said, some of the first members were military guys. We sent out enforcement to actually protect the boundaries of Yellowstone. And we started, you know, basically started the idea of trophy hunting. Um, the populations could not. The dirty, the dirty word. We want to talk. Yep. I want to talk about that too. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that, that was us. And we said, Hey, you know, if hunting is the continue, we cannot put pressure on the females and the young of the population. It needs to be, um, you know, specifically directed to the older mature males that are beyond breeding age that are basically non-contributing to the population for this to continue. And so, you know, trophy hunting now is the worst thing ever. Well, the reason we have wildlife is because of trophy hunting. So yeah. um, how do, how do, oh, uh, man, we're going to spin off in a lot of different directions here. I, I apologize, Justin. No uh, let's let's come back to trophy hunting. I, don't let me forget. I want to come back to trophy hunting after you get you get done with this uh, history. So, you know, we're trying to change the, pop, the, the the public perception of what what is OK. You know, a sportsman elevating the level of the selective hunter. That is the ideal hunter. That's that's who she should aspire to be if you're a sportsman. But at the same time, we're thinking that wildlife's doomed. Um we started our national collection of heads and horns at the Bronx Zoo. And it, you know, that 1907 and it opened in 1922. And over the door at Red, dedicated to the vanishing big game of the world. And our records program began began in earnest trying to um, get a specimen of what was once on our great continent. And it was actually the entire world. They were thinking that wildlife was doomed, right? Yeah. And so our generation, for us, they were trying to get a mounted head on the wall so we could see what a caribou looked like, what a moose looked like. Um, at the same time, we're trying to put this collection together. We're also working within Congress trying to pass laws, um, game laws, you know, funding funding wardens, um, seasons. Um, you know, it's, it's very interesting studying the history of hunting. I mean, back at the time, you were a complete slob hunter if you'd ever consider hunting a deer or an elk in the rut. Um, that's how limited populations were is they could not handle that pressure. And so they were, they were getting different laws passed. Seasons were being shut down. Certain States were not allowed any hunting. Um, you know, Pittman or Robertson, you talk about that funding became available. A lot of the first transplants of wildlife for private individuals, but we started having funding available and we were able to move around animals. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that transitions into, you know, Aldo Leupold, early in his career, was a Forest Service employee in Arizona. The first wildlife study done in North America was one done by Leupold on game management on the range. Boone and Crockett actually funded that. So, you know, we were the very first group to put our money where our mouth was on scientific management of wildlife. Um, you know, once once Leupold got that done, you know, while he went back to Wisconsin, he was also a member of the club. Uh, wildlife management became the way to manage. States started getting wildlife departments. We had wildlife um, degrees. And so these were trained biologists managing these herds and bringing these numbers back. And so, you know, 
40s, obviously World War II, but in 1950, 1949, the club saw that it was no longer a dismal, we're going to kill everything, and it's going to all be gone. Wildlife was recovering. Right. So at that point, we took our records program and said, okay, well, we have all this data, and we thought we were trying to find the biggest show to future generations, but now let's use this records program to try to gauge conservation successes and failures, right? So we can't tell you what the problem is, but I can tell you, for example, you know, the best place to hunt a mountain lion with, you know, in, in the country is Missoula County, Montana, and just over the border in Idaho. Mm -hmm. We can say, this is the best spot to go kill a lion. What's going on there? Where can we replicate this throughout, you know, the mountain lion's range? And so that's how our records program has been maintained since the 50s. Um, and at the same time, we, we still continue to work in D.C. You know, the history of conservation in North America is that of, you know, Boone and Crockett. I mean, yes, we were involved in passing the Wilderness Act. Um, you know, it's very interesting. You know, we're, we're a conservation, not a preservation group. Um, you know, TR is always held up in, in highest regard as, as being, you know, having amazing foresight. You also you're going to you're gonna have to you're going to have to take a break and and oh, no. tell us the difference between preservation and conservation. And I, the reason I want to go back and talk about trophy hunting and what you're talking about right here, it, I want to talk about how we've lost control of that narrative and it's been hijacked by the people that want to take hunting away. But tell us the difference between conservation and preservation. The Houndsman XP podcast is fueled by Joy Dog Food. Joy Dog Food has a rich tradition of supporting the Houndsman of America. Founded in 1945, Joy is proud of its history and the relationship it has built with the American Houndsman. And in 76 years, there's never been a recall. Made with 100% American-made high-quality ingredients, Joy Dog Food has one of the highest calorie-dense formulas on the market. For 76 years, this Made in America product has kept hunting dogs in the field day after day, season after season. And when we say Made in America, Joy has a long track record of fighting for American freedoms by being on the front lines against the animal rights movement and their extremist tactics. Joy will fuel your hounds and fight for your freedoms, fueled by Joy. In essence, preservation is that nature should be able to function without any um, impact from man whatsoever. Mm -hmm. it's a approach. You don't you don't manage. You're not involved. Nature takes care of itself. Conservation was a term coined by you know Boone and Crockett members. It is prudent use without waste. It is it is managing the resource for the most users um, and and taking care of it, not not exploiting it, not frivolous use but it is an active role within conservation, whereas preservation is a hands-off role. I think, so I think we've lost control of that, that narrative, not only in the general public, but, but I even see hunters that, that misuse the terms and, and have bought into the marketing uh, campaigns from the anti-hunters and the way the media spends it. So a lot of times when we as hunters see the term conservation, we've lost sight of what the true meaning of that is as well. And a lot of times we automatically think of the people that are trying to take away hunting. Is it, have you seen that? No, that's, that's correct. Especially in media, you know, um, you, know, you read a headline conservation groups oppose whatever, right? You read the names and you're like, no, no, those are not management groups. Those are 100% hands off, you know, right. no, no people on the planet idea groups. Yeah. 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 So, so we're, we're, we've gotten to the age of the 1950s. Um, I call that, I call that era, uh, I I've got a degree in, in wildlife management and, um, I was a conservation officer for 30 years. So, um, in my study, I wrote a, I wrote a paper in college and, uh, coined it the 19, the, the period following world war II was like the golden age of conservation clubs. Uh, you had, you had the Isaac Walton league, you had the Boone and Crockett club, you had, you know, all these groups and not only large national groups, but the conservation club locally, like Sunman fish and game club. That's 20 minutes, 30 minutes North of my house, Lawfrey Valley fish and game club were all established during that time. And, and people would come together at those clubs and they would do projects like habitat restoration or river cleanup or, or something. And, and 
the reason I think it was the golden age is because all of these men returning from World War II, they spent years in tight fraternal organizations, and they understood what it was like to be a part of something bigger than themselves. So they brought that passion and that energy back here. They were missing that fraternal organization and boom, you've got, you've got all this grassroots work happening out here locally and nationally. Is that, is that, have you seen that or have you considered that? You know, I hadn't looked at it in the fifties. Um, you know, that, that, I mean, that does make sense. That was a big increase. That's, you know, when, when the interest in, in hunting and the outdoors really expanded. And, you know, yeah. I think you're true. And very much so it could have been from, you know, what, what they were missing, you know, being a part of something. Um, mm-hmm. You know, in fact, not a lot of people really know is, is uh, fisheries, basically hatcheries, was the founding of conservation. Before we ever did hunting, Roosevelt's uncle, I believe it was, was really into fishery introduction on the East Coast. And so there's a lot of of parallels from the early conservation movement to the idea that that we would have. I mean, this this is hilarious. The the game was so scarce that we thought we'd have to have like hatcheries for deer to kick out for hunters to be able to pursue. (laughs) Uh, Well, (laughs) I'll tell you what, some of the old videos here, like Indiana in the. um, Oh, man, I'm going to I'm going to mess up this date. This goes back to college days, too. I think it was 1910, the last known deer was killed in Indiana in 1910 in Knox County, Indiana. And during the the 40s and the 50s, there are are these old relic videos of then the Department of Conservation releasing deer. And and, you know, the it was it was epic. It was happened down at Glendale Fish and Wildlife Area is one of the places that that took place. But I don't I, I. If we don't know the history, then we're, you know, we're doomed to repeat it. Of course, that's kind of a pun. And, but, um, we got, I, it just fascinates me. So, so go well, ahead. It, it, no, it does. And, you know, you feel free to stop me. I get rolling on this history stuff. And I, get really oh, I can get, I can get off on tangents too. So <laughs> we'll have to, we'll have to hold each other back uh, here. So anyway, we're in the, we're in the fifties and the sixties. Um, Wildlife management's, you know, gaining gaining traction. We're seeing increasing populations, and you know, we also were starting. You know, you get into this late sixties and early seventies, you get the the environmental movement. Like I said, the Club mm-hmm. One Wilderness Act. You know, there was there was a lot of good that came out of that. The Endangered Species Act was was not. I mean, it was landmark legislation for the time. Um, perhaps there's a couple of things in there that we might be able to refine today to be a little more successful, but you know, that was the, 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 the root of, of the conservation movement, or, I mean, excuse me, of the, uh, the environmental movement in the country, which is, which has benefited hunters as well. I mean, we don't necessarily take ownership of that, but just an awareness of, of the country and its resources and trying to take care of it was a good thing. And so, you know, as, as we're going on through, through that time, you start seeing, um, you know, different legislations, different funding mechanisms, um, you know, just more, more work being done on the part of the club, trying to um, basically better wildlife and, and its habitat. Um, You know, there, there was a lot of stuff in the, in the early years that, um, you know, the national park service was, was something that we, the first, you know, um, chief of the park service was a Boone and Crockett member, Gifford Mm -hmm. Pinchot, Forest Service, you know, we got on this a little bit on conservation versus preservation. Originally, all of our national forests when Roosevelt set them aside were reserves. Mm-hmm. And again, it was these were going to be a hands off, no touch. And Pinchot, who was, um, you know, educated in forestry, basically said, you know, no, if, if there's not a if people don't have ownership in it and they, they don't you know, feel like they use it, it's not going to be successful. And so from the very beginning, the Forest Service was set up to manage, you know, these great reserves and and eventually calls them national forests. That's something that Roosevelt did. It's created the National Forest Service. Um, And so, you know, from the beginning, we set up North American conservation to be an active, managed, you know, thing, not a not a hands off approach. So so with with Roosevelt and uh, Grinnell and, you know, some of these guys doing all this work. Were they the ones you talked about the the first original funding? Were they working within 
our government to create funding mechanisms along with private support to to really take ownership of this this issue we have with wildlife this problem early on much of it was privately funded okay uh, the, the the club was set up to have 100 members from the very beginning that's technically still in our bylaws we only have 100 regular members of Boone and Crockett and so these were the conservation giants and they they brought many industries to the table and funding and that's where a lot of it came early on um it you know it wasn't it wasn't until later on i mean we've always been working on it but you know, farm bill and whatnot, that's all well, you know, into the future. From the, the very beginning, it was mostly privately funded or private organizations. Like you said, there was there was a lot of local level uh, sportsman's clubs, and that was a lot of the funding and the game regulations for states came from that local level private, you know, private funding. Well, I think that's really interesting because one of the things that we talk about a lot on this podcast is about being involved in your local uh, hound, hound organization, you know, to, to devote your time to that, your energy to that, uh, at least, at least part of it. And if we all do a little bit, then we can do a lot. And, uh, so we're always talking about that. Uh, one of the things that, that I'm wondering about and, and, uh, our listeners might benefit from too, is, um, you said that even today, the Boone and Crockett has 100 regular members, and you're you're limited to that, right? Correct. So let's let's I'm gonna kind of do a comparison here because I want your opinion on that. You know, in 1870, around 1900, that time period, hunting hunting was much more mainstream, almost vogue uh, type. It wasn't uncommon. Everybody in their family had hunters in it, and it wasn't it wasn't something that was so foreign. So, how has that changed the Boone and Crockett Club from that time? Maybe your marketing, where how you're getting your funding, things like that, to 2023. So, it's it's really interesting. You know, it, when when you talk about the very beginning, there was actually there was a big push within society to distance ourselves from nature. Um, you look at, you know, bear meat in the early 1800s was, was Staple. a devil. Yeah. I mean, that, that was, you went to the finest restaurant and you'd have a bear roast. Um, as the country, oh, okay. I, as, yeah. the, as the country began to develop, people didn't want to be associated with these backwoods hillbilly types. And so, hey, know, that's me. Yeah, eating <laughs> e eating that type of thing. They they wanted to be very civilized, and so we lost a lot of that, um, you know, identity as hunters. And so we also, I mean, there was there was challenges then that you know you you look at Muir, and I mean his his comment to Roosevelt, like, oh, you've never given up that boyish pursuit of hunting, or there's something to that equivalent, you know. <laughs> mocking Roosevelt for still being a hunter and like you hunted and fished as a kid but you grew out of that as you became you know civilized and moved into the adult world and mm. so even even back then there was there wasn't the acceptance of hunting now you know the 60s you know the booming days of hunting that would have been the, the highest point of, of hunter participation in the country that time that you were talking about when a lot of the local groups were getting started the the bigger national groups that mm -hmm. was that was the time that we had the most participation in hunting within the country that I'm aware of. Um, but, you know, as you're alluding to now, you know, that, that participation is dropping now. And, you know, from a, from a marketing standpoint, um, you know, our big thing is that wildlife needs managed. Um, hunting is a, is a tool, you know, to control populations and also to fund that um, folks don't realize, you know, how much Pittman Robertson funding, you know, does for natural resources. They don't realize, you know, um, I mean, do you, have even a, with, do you have an estimate on those dollar amounts? Is, is it 6 billion annually or, or, no, am, I, or no, am I low? That's the, I think that's the, the total, um, in the time of the program was 6 billion. Okay. Um, it is significant though. And it is, it is earmarked for conservation. That's mm -hmm. Very important thing with, you know, recently there was some legislation that came up. That they were trying to repeal um, Pittman Robertson and, it yes. was, it, you know, it, 
it's one of the few funds that the money is 100% earmarked to our community. We do not want conservation funding to be fought over, you know, with a, um, you know, federal spending bill. Exactly. You know, when, when the government shuts down because we can't come to an agreement because of the, uh, you know, the polarization of D.C., you know, we don't want our funding held hostage. And mm -hmm. so that's what Boone and Crockett has always tried to do within within our work in D.C. is make sure this is dedicated funding. You know, we don't like I said, we don't we don't want it to dry up. This is permanent funding, long term funding. It doesn't matter who's in office. You know, the wildlife is still there. It doesn't matter. You know, they don't have an R or a D. It's not like some years they do better than others. Right. It, it's it's a, another thing. I, I imagine. I mean, can you imagine how many fingers are trying to to get in that fund and and <laughs> you know dip their fingers in that and pull a little piece of that out uh, it's got to be a full-time battle it is it is and it's you know there's there's other groups working on it it's not just boone and crockett but a lot of hunters don't realize the amount of effort that these groups these national groups i mean you know sci boone and crockett i mean all these big groups are constantly working in dc to make sure that our wildlife and our agencies are continually funded yeah yeah let's let's go back to uh I want to talk about the dirty word, trophy hunting, because I think that is, um, again, that's one of those terms that has been hijacked, um, redefined, and then uh, spit back out in a way that's not uh, very, it's not, it's not very flattering to the hunting industry. Uh, even hunters have a hard time resolving their own moral and ethical code when it comes to um, trophy hunting versus meat hunting or sustenance hunting. So let's, let's talk about the, I want to really dive down and, and get a definition of what trophy hunting originally started as and why it was impl why it was widely accepted and, and how we can explain it today in a way well, explain it today in our current in our current environment. Hey, we're getting ready to shift gears in this podcast. And before we do, this is a great spot to tell you about three companies that have put their name on the line and been willing to stand up and help us with the fight to preserve, protect, and promote this lifestyle of being a houndsman. You can find all of our sponsored companies on our new website at houndsmanxp.com, but let's talk about those companies. The first company is Dogs Are Treat, our longest standing sponsor of this show. Kevin and Nancy are serious about the future of houndsmen and the future of hound hunting. Not to mention the fact that they are producing the highest quality gear in the industry from tie outs to leashes to paws are protected, dogs are hydrated. It's all stuff that you can find on their website at dogsartree.com or you can go to our website, hit the link, and boom, you're right there. You'll also see these products popping up at youth events, at or state organization events, you know, water races, field trials. They're donating their, their products because they believe in this lifestyle. And when you shop with Dogs Are Treed and you enter that promo code HXP20% off, you're supporting this show so we can stand in the fight together. We're standing there together. So another company that I want to talk to you about is Cajun Lights. L.W. Nixon is just a super guy. He's straightforward. Uh, he's he's going to shoot you straight every time. But Cajun Lights is producing a high-quality light, high-quality vest. He's got more stuff coming. And uh, he believes in customer service. He's trying to source as many parts as he can for his lights right here out of the good old U.S. of A. He builds every light that goes out of that shop. So... He wants your feedback. We're going to feature him here on a podcast coming up, and you're going to want to listen to that. But you can find that company on our website and watch our social media post for a new promo code coming out where you're going to be able to save 10% on all of their Cajun Light products. The last organization I want to talk about is Freedom Hunters. Freedom Hunters takes America's veterans to the field, gets them reconnected with the outdoor hunting, fishing lifestyle. That is so important for us. When we have America's heroes who are being honored and, and taken back to the field that can speak positively about hunting, 
Politicians listen to veterans, and veterans vote. And veterans aren't afraid to get in that fight. They're not afraid to challenge people. So if you have not contacted us about hosting a Freedom Hunters event this fall, man, you need to get busy and get with us. Our calendar is filling up. we got a lot of stuff going on. But you can find out all that information by going to freedomhunters.org, and you can support them there, or you can register for an event there. Or if you want to make it a one-stop shop, we've got that organization's logo. We've got Freedom Hunters on our website. Click on their logo. Boom, you're going to go right to the website and you can take care of business. Go to houndsmanxp.com and check out these three companies and all of our sponsors over there that love freedom, they love hound hunting, and they want to support you. Go to houndsmanxp.com, check them out. Let's get back to Boone and Crockett. Wrap this one up with Justin Spring. So whenever, whenever the you know the, the derby trophy hunting phrase comes up, and I'm talking to somebody that that you know is, is hugely opposed to it, the very first thing I say is if if trophy hunting was actually what you're defining it as, I'm against it too. Mm-hmm. Um, this this idea that the only reason we're out there is to adorn our walls with with big antlers or skulls or whatever it may be. That's, that's not what your modern hunter is. That, that is not correct. It's not even legal within the U S to, to not take the meat to want and waste. I mean, it's a huge deal if you're not doing everything. And so, you know, this idea that these people are just out there killing North American animals just for killing and you see it with wolves and, you know, that's a big battle obviously in the, in the Rockies where we are is, Oh, it's a, it's a trophy hunt, you know? Right. Right. You know, no, it's, it's a management hunt and, Mm -hmm. and it's not legal just to kill something, just to kill it and put it on your wall. That, that's not what we're doing. And so when you find that common ground and say, hey, we don't believe in that either, you know, that that kind of that, that helps you direct the conversation. But I, I don't know if we're ever going to really get the term back. I mean, what we consider trophy hunting, what, what Boone and Crockett, why we refer to everything in our book as trophies is more of a selective hunting um, in modern vernacular you know, where you're trying to not affect the population, but only take out the, the oldest mature males. And the other hard thing today is, you know, folks, I mean, you're talking about they were releasing deer, you know, right. the, the previous generation, it'd be big news. If somebody saw a deer track, they would the whole family would get in a car and drive three counties over to go see a deer track. Um, the idea now that you have deer to levels that are destroying people's hedges and they can't stand them. It's just hard for them to comprehend <laughs> this idea that like it wasn't that long ago that, that this resource wasn't there. And so they're like, well, you're just shooting the big males. You know, that's a horrible thing. Well, as hunters too, we need to participate in management. Um, you know, if the state's saying, please kill 14 does for every buck as hunters, we should be doing that. And I think that helps us fight that trophy mentality. Right. I mean, if the deer are overpopulated, you know, that white tails are very good at it. And as a hunter, you're only shooting one buck a year and refusing to help in management. You're not really helping our case, yeah. you know? Yeah. And that's, I think a lot of people see that and that's where they're, you know, saying, well, trophy hunting. And, and like I said, I, you can tell with what I'm saying. I don't necessarily agree with that as a hunter to only shoot that one buck and not participate and do your part. Yeah. So a couple of questions come out and I'll get to that in just a second, but I told a story on another podcast I was a guest on another podcast here last week or a couple of weeks ago. I talked about being a kid in central Indiana and we'd never seen a deer in the wild from our house ever. Um, and I remember the day that, that, uh, dad came running in the house to tell us that were, there were deer in the winter wheat field across from the house from us. And there were, there was, I don't know, there were probably, five or six kids. There were probably five kids at the time in my family. Uh, the sixth one hadn't been born yet, but I remember piling out on our front porch and mom holding the youngest, which would have been my sister. And we're all standing there in awe, looking at a white tailed deer across, across the road from the house. It's just a totally, uh, unfamiliar thing for, for anybody that was born before 1985, probably. Yeah. Yeah, since since 1985 so yeah, uh, yeah. so, that's, so that's, 
I'm Go sorry. Ahead. I'm sorry. We can't. Our our technical difficulty is we can't see each other now. So this is this is a <laughs> little bit rough. Uh, we can't we can't key in on those nonverbal cues. But uh, uh, the question the question I would have is. Uh, you talked about taking the large mature males and I'm sure this is something that you've talked about numerous times. There you are. There we go. Got you back. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you've talked about this numerous times, Jess, and it's going to be, you know, real easy for you to talk about this, but what is the benefit to the resource of hunters targeting the, the large mature male species the i the idea of that is that you're trying to target them once they've already contributed to the population right they've already been they've already bred they're already through their you know their their dominant phase of of you know breeding success and so if you're looking at the population as a whole those basically are the expendable ones that are not increasing your numbers and so it, I, I talked about whitetail a little bit. It's no longer important to only shoot the largest, you know, past breeding whitetail because we can't keep their numbers in check. You look at some of these species in the West that you're waiting 20, 30 years to draw a tag, you know, big horn sheep. Yep. I, we, we want to be, we want to be putting the pressure on those, on those expendable members of, of the population to continue hunting and not be pressuring the young and whatnot. And there's sheep aren't, a, you know, there is areas that they do need you harvest. There is areas that do very mountain goats. There's a, a place in mm -hmm. Montana. They, they can't kill enough mountain goats. It's kind of unheard of with their super low reproductive rates. But, you know, a lot of the reason I think trophy hunting is no longer as respected and revered is that wildlife's to a, a, a point where it's not as necessary to restrict, restrict yourself in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's still, it's, it's not a bad thing. You know, um, the example I use is Montana gives you a moose tag. And no matter what, if you kill or not, you have a seven-year waiting period. Um, you get to the end of season, you know that you have to wait seven years before you can apply again. You know, the resource is able to handle you filling that tag on a lesser bull. But that would be a situation where, you know, as a conservationist, I would say, hey, maybe, maybe don't just shoot something so you fill a tag. It's okay to wait that seven years. You know, and you're talking about moose. Yep, and yeah. that's just a particular example with Montana. I'm just familiar with that one. I, you know, yeah. I had a moose a few years back, and I remember that dilemma. You know, when I get to the end of the season, you know, you're looking at bulls and like, what am I going to take? And like oh, maybe I'd take that towards the end. And I really started thinking about that. And I was like, you know, I don't, I mean, this is a limited species. Everybody wants an opportunity to do this. This is a really good tag. And, you know, I'd convince myself I wasn't going to shoot a bull. I wasn't going to be happy with, you know, at right. the end of the season, to fill a tag. And so, you know, trying to explain it that way to folks now is a little easier than, oh, I'm just out looking for the biggest. You know, it's harder right. to comprehend why somebody would do that. Yeah, we, um, of course, this show talks a lot about predator management because we're bear hunters, lion hunters, bobcat hunters, uh, you know, those species that um, affect those other wildlife species. <clears throat> but a large mature male, I I mean, how many, by the time, by the time a, uh, a moose reaches four years old, how many cows has he bred? over those years you know he's already passed on that genetic right diversity to his herd and there are probably younger bulls there are younger bulls coming up behind him that can do the same thing when you talk about predators you know you're talking about black bear and and lot, mountain lion you know by three or four years old uh not only are they not only are they um have passed on their genetic diversity they've also killed several cubs they've killed right. they've killed lion kittens and things like that so that's another reason that that we talk about often of of why you wait let that younger tom grow a little bit and there's an older tom out there for you for you to uh to catch and take if that's if that's what you want to do yeah yeah and in the it gets a little interesting when we, when we move into the predator realm, I grew up in Oregon and right when I got to be hunting age, there was that great bill that a lot, disallowed dogs and bait for bears and cougars in mm -hmm. Oregon. 
Yeah. And so it, it was, I can't remember the exact dates, but nobody had really hunted bears for a while because nobody knew how to do it spot and stock. And that was right about the time I turned 16 and got a truck. And so I got to witness, you know, what happens to an unmanaged predator population and see what it did to our deer populations and everything, you know, coming from that place and, and trying to explain to people that like, you know, no, that these are, these animals in certain situations, you are actually impeding, you know, the other wildlife's ability to survive by limiting hunters on the methodology that they can employ to take these animals. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it, you know, at the same time, there is a time and place, Oregon, for example, that, you know, they do allow electronic calls for bears. Boone and Crockett says that using electronic calls is not fair chase, but in that case, we're not going to say, you know, you're doing something wrong because you're managing, managing predators by using a call, but at the same time, it's not in the book. And we do discuss that type of thing. You know, we do not want to hamstring the state wildlife agencies by saying, you know, Oh, you can't use this particular tactic because we know it's necessary for management. And so, you know, that's one of the the, the interesting things that I get out of this job is, is how do we, how do we modify the idea of, of, of trophy hunting, that you'd know for ungulates to that of bears and, and cats. Mm-hmm. And- yeah. So before we get off of trophy hunting uh, and move on, because you opened up, you opened up the, uh, the topic of fair chase right there with your last comment. Uh, yeah. But before we get off of that, I would say this to anybody listening to this podcast. If, if you, if trophy hunting is something that we have all engaged in, if you have ever set, in a tree stand and passed up a four corn buck in hopes that an eight pointer would walk by, then, then you're, you have been selective in the, uh, what you're, what you're going to shoot that day. If you've done it with bears, if you've done it with the mountain lions, if you've done any of that stuff, then you better be careful because you could be characterized as a trophy hunter at that point. I think it's a real easy way to boil it down to, um, you know, not only combat the argument, but also face the fact that, that we are all selective at times in, in the way we do it. And, and that's, in my opinion, that's what trophy hunting really is, is being selective, uh, to, to harvest the most beneficial animal that needs to come off the landscape. Minimizing our impact, you know, out there on the landscape. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's talk about fair chase. And, and this has been getting a lot of media, uh, in the hound hunting community is the, the topic of fair chase. Uh, it's one of those things that, that we're constantly battling with the anti hunting crowd, uh, even among other hunting cultures or groups or pursuits that, that want to talk about the use of hounds, not being fair chase. And I want to go back to the origins because Boone and Crockett is the originator of that term. And, uh-huh. uh, you guys have been the caretakers. And I would even go as far as to say that when there are issues pertaining to fair chase, wildlife managers, legislative bodies, they look to Boone and Crockett for guidance on what that is and what that is not. Yep. So I guess to start on the fair chase conversation, it's kind of evolved about the same time that, you know, the fifties and sixties, when our, when our records program shifted gears, the purpose of fair chase kind of changed. Like I said, we'd, um, it started out, there was no game laws and and hunters had to self-regulate. And so that was truthfully the very beginning. And interestingly, one of the very first terms of fair chase, um, you know, said by Roosevelt was basically you don't shoot a mountain lion or a wolf in a trap. And this, this was, you know, one of the founding principles of the organization. Mm. And at the time, you know, everything was, you know, was, was at a minimum, um, in the fifties, we now have game agencies, right? They, they are doing the management. Another, another interesting fact, when we look at mountain lions is, you know, they were a, a pest until Maurice Horniker did his work in Idaho. Um, kind of showing that those top end lions will somewhat self-regulate in that they won't cohabitate the same, um, the, the same area. Mm-hmm. And so that was another work that was funded by BC 
that was when most states actually started recognizing lions as a game species, um, you know. And so the fair chase to that point was a necessity to make sure that we didn't exploit wildlife. Well, in the 50s and 60s, like I said, you know, things are starting to change. Fair chase is still important today because it's the ethical code that allows hunters to continue to hunt, right? Um, if the, the hunting population is what, six, 7% of the country, right? something percent of Americans don't hunt themselves, but approve of it. And so fair chase today is our code as hunters that we can show that 70 something percent and say, this is an ethical, you know, legal thought out approach. Whenever we're looking at fair chase, it's no longer, is this, is this required to save the species? It's, is this tactic sustainable with continued hunting? Um, when it comes to baiting, when it comes to dog usage, we, we do get a, a fair amount of pressure and, and more so lately on baiting with CWD as it relates to deer. Right. And they, we've been asked to come out with a blanket ban on baiting. And we always say, no, there, there's places within the country that to successfully, you know, manage for, you know, the, the bears you want to take, the only way to do that is via dogs or bait. And so as a whole, baiting is not bad. If the state says we want to ban baiting for deer because of CWD within our state, yes, we'd support them on that case for a management deal, but not because it's not a fair pursuit of the wildlife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so as far as fair chase goes, um, how do houndsmen one, I like, I like talking, I like talking about how to talk about hunting. So mm -hmm. when, when I think that's one of the places where we fall on our face a lot is, is our ability to articulate and talk about the reasons why we hunt. And when you're talking about the use of hounds, like I said, that's a favorite target. It's a, it's a low rung on the ladder. Um, but when we're talking about hound usage, tell me how we talk about that as a general, general population of houndsmen and, and defend it. Hounds are hound usage is a tough one to defend within our own community because we have people that don't understand the effort that a good houndsman's putting in. Um, two of the best outdoorsmen I know are hardcore hounds guys. Mm -hmm. And, I feel like, I mean, I'm in a position where I get to talk to a lot of hunters and I have very good examples. I can say, Hey, go talk to so-and-so. They will show you that the way this is being done is done correctly. Um, you know, as, as a houndsman, you, the ability to read tracks, the ability to see, you know, what's, what's transpiring to read the woods or I mean, and I'm not a houndsman. I, you know, I, I have nothing against it. Like I said, I've just never had hounds myself, but that's what I think the houndsmen are missing is, is, you know, don't be afraid to share your knowledge of the woods. It's not just about that bear or that, but I mean, you're out there, you know, how things go. And, and when we are talking about it, you know, highlight that stuff, um, you know, let people infer for themselves how in tune you're actually being with in the woods when you're running your dogs. Um, you know, Boone and Crockett, you know, again, we're, we're dealing with perception for, our, for our fair chase, for running of hounds, for, for bears and, and cats. We have a rule that says, you know, if electronic, you know, you cannot use an electronic collar to find your hounds during the pursuit. And there's a lot of confusion on this. And this is originally why I talked to let's, you, Chris. Yeah. Let's, to get, let's save that. Cause I want, I want to wrap that? up. I want to wrap up with that. Uh, I want to get, I'd like to stay on, on the, the fair chase side of it. Uh, a lot of what I see, uh, social media is such a great thing, right? You can, <laughs> you can find so many, so many nice comments out there when you post stuff about hounds, especially in just general hunting groups. But, uh, uh, you know, you, you'll get a guy that, that will, will snipe you and say, well, I would never hunt with hounds because that's not fair chase. Um, uh, I don't, I think it gives you an unfair advantage. And my first, my first, anytime I'm talking to someone one-on-one, -on -one, I don't engage in these large debates or anything like that. I used to, uh, don't anymore. It's fruitless, pointless. But when I'm talking to some, a hunter in person that may think that, 
I always take them back to uh, the paleoglyphics, <laughs> the, the, the writing, the pictures on the on the cave wall. You know, some of the earliest earliest documented forms of hunting was with a man and a dog and a spear. So if if it was if it was uh, an unfair advantage, then why are people running around with guns and compound bows and optics? And you know, we've come a long way to to increase our odds as hunters than than when the the first man was domesticated the dog and and used it to for a survival tool and and hunting purposes. Yep. <laughs> uh, oh man, it's it's. But the other thing, the other thing about the the other thing about fair chase, and and I'll get your opinion on this. Um, fair chase, when when we're pursuing animals, the the animal is one hundred percent aware of the fact that he's being pursued from the time that, and he can use all of his senses at that point to evade and escape, and often he does, and he's his, he's in his own environment. He's using the landscape to his advantage. He's using the elements to his advantage. We're, we're going into his own bedroom. My hounds may have never been like in the Swan Valley of, of Montana, just north of you there. Uh, you know, we, we, we hunt there. And when I drop my hounds there from Indiana, I guarantee you that they're not familiar like a mountain lion is. And right. I, I'm just trying to put some information out there for our listeners that, that might be able to develop somewhat of a narrative an informed narrative and, and not fight with people, but give them some information that, that you may never win them over, but you might give them some fresh perspective on it. Well, the, the biggest thing with hounds, you know, we, we, we did a meme here at Boone and Crockett. Don't hate what you don't understand. It was John Lennon quote. It's one of the most popular memes we've ever put out. And I don't remember what it was in relation to, but, but that's the biggest thing with, with what I see, you know, within the industry and talking to folks on the fair chase side is, is folks have this preconceived idea of what a hound hunt is and they've none of them have been on one. They've never seen it done. They've never, never interacted with it. And, you know, if you're a hunter and I mean, you know, how much that frustrates you when somebody tells you what you're doing is wrong without understanding it. Are you not doing the same thing to the houndsman by making that statement? That's a good point. That's a good point. All right. Let's, let's, let's dive into Boone and Crockett's opinion on tracking devices. And, and if you don't mind, I would like to read it uh, from your website. And then we discuss the topic from there. Because I think it's something that needs some clarity. Um, and and maybe uh, it would be beneficial for a houndsman to hear the Boone and Crockett position on this. But this is what it says. This is an opinion from your website. It says, almost all cougars are hunting using dogs because of the considerable difficulty in locating them without dogs. In many locations, dogs are also used to hunt bear. The practice is legal in many states. The club finds that using electronic collars to ensure far-ranging dogs do not become lost is understandable and acceptable, but using electronic collars to more easily locate and access a treed bear or cougar in order to take a shot is not appropriate use of that technology. And I'm sure that's a paraphrase. I'm sure is that, is that the actual language of the opinion or is that a paraphrase that, easy? That, read? Was, that was a clarify clarifying paragraph. We tried to put out there to explain our position. Okay. Um, it, it goes back to before there was GPS callers, there was the, the radio transmitter and you had the, the antenna. Right. And running the dogs. And as soon as the hunt was over and you couldn't find a dog, you'd flip on the antenna and go find it. So the old saying was, as soon as you turn on the receiver, the hunt's over. Um, GPS technology with where it's come, obviously the second those dogs go, now we have wolves on the landscape in the upper, you know, Rocky Mountains, all that. Um that that was something that the club had never seen and we can't i mean everybody's running those collars now we know that these dogs are huge investments they're members of the family um and so times have changed and so a little bit of this confusion is is the the club was was i guess stutter stepping a little bit trying to figure out how we ensure you know the continued use of hounds without completely relying on technology and, and basically it's come down to a point where 
most entries that we get in, they'll say, yes, I used electronic callers. We get a narrative in. We read that narrative and say, hey, was this hunt, would this have happened if they hadn't used technology? Basically like, hey, we lost the entire pack. We turned on the receiver, found them an hour later, and then walked in on the cat. That's what we're saying is, is crossing the line. Um, you're leaning on that technology. If, if that cat somehow evades you and you lose your dogs, the cat's won. That's the fair chase aspect. Um, leaning on that technology to refine those hounds, that is the point that the club's saying, hey, maybe, maybe that's where we need to kind of draw the line and say, hey, you know, that cat won this particular race. Let's, let's, you know, reset. I mean, you can use the collars, find the dogs, but, you know, for entry into the, into the book, that cat won and you're giving yourself an unfair advantage by using that technology to find your dogs instead of staying with them or, you know, a, the classic sense of a hound hunt. Okay. So as, as a podcaster, you know, uh, I'm going to bring some clarity from, from our side and, and challenge you a little bit on this. Hope you're prepared for that. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it, are there, how many have your, have your entries for mountain lion? Let's just talk mountain lion. Cause that is most commonly the, um, uh, the species that, that hound hunters, that a lot of non uh, hound owners will use to harvest a mountain lion. So have the numbers of Boone and Crockett entries for, for mountain lions gone down since you implemented this opinion? Not to a point that I would say is statistically significant, but I do not have the data on percentage of lions that we're getting mm -hmm. right so is there is there tremendous cats being taken certainly mm -hmm. that we're not seeing. we know that that's that's across the board in all categories we do not get 100 percent entry rate we are staying static on what we've gotten um but that being said you know is that two percent is that 20 percent is that 80 percent of, you know, 14 and a half inch cats that are taken that we see. Yeah. I'm just curious because, you know, uh, say you take a guy from the East here, he's looking for a mountain lion hunt. I know several people, uh, from back here that, that have the means to, and it's become a more and more common to hire an outfitter to take them lion hunting without having to raise train, you right. know, care for hounds, all that stuff. Uh, but when they book a hunt, you know, one of the common questions is still coming up can you get me a book cat? And, and at what point, um, are the, are the records being fudged or then how do, you know, th that's what I'm looking at is, is your, your, your person, your client or your customer that wants to have a book cat, cause maybe they're going after a North American grand slam or whatever it is, you know, how is that adversely affecting their abilities to do that in your yeah. opinion? I mean, it's a, it's an interesting question. The answer is, I mean, basically we don't know. We don't know. I mean, yeah. you know it's all, all conjecture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't, I don't have any rock solid data to say this or that. I, I do know that in my position, you know, with, with the records program, that's the worst statement I can hear is I want a book cat. Yeah. Um, that's, but, that's not, that's not what the system was ever set up to do. Right. You're supposed to be out there. You're supposed to enjoy the hunt, everything about it. You know, you're buying out of state licenses. You're supporting a local economy. You're doing everything, all the positives of hunting. If you take a mature Tom that happens to qualify for the record book, that's in addition. The, the final number on a trophy should never make or break your hunt. And um, out, outfitters hate that question, oh, by the way. Yeah. Anybody that's listened to this podcast, it's an auto houndsman that just tuned in because Justin Spring from Boone and Crockett is on here. Outfitters hate that question. Houndsmen, mm -hmm. ha houndsmen hate that question. They aren't looking for book cats. You know, they want to get you an experience. They want to expose you to hunting with hounds. All of those different things. They're not, no houndsman wants to carry somebody along just so they can kill something. We want to share our lifestyle with you as a hunter and, and take it all in 
from you know from all perspectives. We want you to feel the struggle. I just had Brad Luttrell from uh, Go Wild. He went on a bear hunt with us, and uh, we punished him. <laughs> I mean, he he got punished on the hunt, and I, and I told the guys they were, were kind of apprehensive about it. They were they were thinking, oh man, I hope I hope we didn't make them mad. I hope that was a an okay that was rough, man. You think they'll come back? And they were they loved it. I'm, I said, guys, that's the best thing that we could have done. There is nobody that I want to take hunting that might be on the fence or not have any exposure to hunting with hounds and be like, man, this is, this is easy, you know, because right. it's not. Nine times out of – you got the one out of 100 hunt if you said that was easy. Yeah, no, I mean, we I, I, a lot of the, the outdoor media guys are friends of mine. We work with a lot of them. But, man, like we're not real good at showing them how hard it really is to do <laughs> do what we do. <laughs> Oh yeah, because we cherry pick, we cherry pick the pictures we put on social media. We we cherry pick the video. We we do all this stuff, and we don't because uh, we want to show the success. And I've I've got several friends that are like, man, you need to talk about failure more often. And that's not hard for me to do. You know, <laughs> I can I can come up with the failures real easy. But oh, yeah. getting getting back to the getting back to the opinion, you know, I I would argue that. Uh, you know, if I lose my hounds on a hunt, the bear hasn't, the bear of the lion has not won at that point. The hunt, the hunt is not over. Um, it may take me hiking my guts out to the top of the next peak so that I can locate my dogs again, but I'm not going to quit that hunt simply because I lost a dog. And the, no, and, I mean, that's the line that's crossed is like, you lose them, they go over the next canyon or whatever. You got to hike to that high point. Maybe you can hear them again. That's fine. But it's when you look at that caller, you know, you look at that receiver and say, oh man, we'll just go back to the truck and drive over here because they're right there. From a perception standpoint, that's not necessarily exactly how it goes, obviously. But to somebody that's never been on the hunt, well, they have a caller tracking them and they can just go back to the truck and drive to where the, the icon showing treed. Again, we're dealing with perception as well as, you know, I mean, what, what is fair and what is not to the animal. And mm -hmm. so that, that's where we came up with this, this line, as if, if the harvest happened because of the technology, if you're relying on that technology, that's the line that it crosses. If, if you kick out on the dog, you could lose them. You could go back to the truck and drive to the next ridge and then get out and audibly pick them up. That, that isn't using the technology to find them. That's using your skills as a houndsman. And that's the way it was always done. And that is the fair chase use of a hound. And so that's why it is what it is. You know, the, does that make sense to you? Uh, the, the reason, the reason that it's, that it's such a highly debated issue is because at what, uh, for one thing, we battle all across the United States the use of GPS tracking equipment because they feel, you know, that the people who are against the use of that, um, they don't understand why we're using GPS tracking equipment. You know, you, you brought up wolves in, in your comment earlier. And, um, we know as houndsmen, you know, we call them wolf pits. We keep track of where those wolves are and we start seeing them roll over into the next drainage where, Ma'am, three days ago, we saw a pack of wolves where we found a wolf kill in there. Now my hounds are headed that way. I got to get my hands on them. Um, and I don't think Boone and Crockett is saying don't use GPS tracking equipment. That's not your position at all. No. <laughs> it's just that it's just the fact that that people will look. OK, say let's just throw a group out there, an anti hunting group that, that wants to respond strict us from hunting with hounds because they're not coming after the hunting. They're coming after our ability to, uh, to keep hounds, house hounds and the equipment that we're using a lot of times. So Boone and Crockett comes out and says, Hey, this isn't fair chase. Now this zealot that's standing in front of wildlife managers says even Boone and Crockett says it's not fair chase. They won't accept it. They won't accept a book, uh, uh, an entry if it was used using this technology. So why are we allowing it to be hunted with? You know, and, and that's what we were trying to get at with, you know, using them for the safety of dogs and trying to, to give a nod to that in case I do get that call. Because a commission will call us and say, hey, what's your thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. You know, I try to give them the whole scene. Like, yeah, I mean, 
like I said, I, well, one of our neighbors has hounds. He's a, he's a, a stellar houndsman and he killed two wolves basically in our backyard coming down messing with his hounds. So it is a reality where mm-hmm. we are. We're very aware that, that this is an issue and the GPS collars allows, you know, houndsmen to, to prevent their dogs from being easy pickings or at least slightly reduce the odds of their dogs from getting picked off. And so we've never come out saying that there's not a place for it. We're saying the abuse of the technology. It okay. is a tech that could be abused. Don't <clears throat> abuse it. It's very similar to what we say on cellular trail cameras. Yeah. Um, the trail camera itself, the technology is not a violation. An abuse of that technology is where the lines crossed on fair chase. I could be sitting here in the office right now with you. Well, it's not season, but you know, right. you get the, I yeah. have a trail route. Oh, there's a buck that just came out into my backfield. I go home and shoot it. That's, that's a little bit. I mean, <laughs> or, or you're, yeah. you're, you're working, you're, yeah, you're working from home. Like, mm. like I am. And all of a sudden my cell, cell camera goes off and there's old mossy horn standing in my food plot that I can see from the porch. I'll just right. grab the rifle right here. Boom. Yeah. I get, I, yeah. And, and, and I know, I know I was, I, I just felt like we needed to have, um, uh, uh, an in-depth conversation about what this is. And cause overall, I'm just going to say it. There would be no uh, hunting in the United States, if it had not been for the early work of the Boone and Crockett club and its founders. Um, and we, we need to value that and, and understand what your organization is trying to do. And, um, the rest of it, I think we can sort out as we go along, you know, as, as we, as we continue to grow as hunters. So I, I, that's that's why I wanted to drill down into it pretty hard. I think a lot of houndsmen have a uh, have um, some conflict with it. Oh, and I I understand because houndsmen are a target of a lot of groups. And, and yeah. when, when a big conservation organization comes out and says you know doing this this way is wrong, I think houndsmen are a little more defensive than a lot of other yeah. houndsmen. I, I that's why I'm always happy to talk to them. It's like we're not we're not saying the technology's bad. We're not saying don't protect your dogs. We, you know, we're not saying you're doing anything wrong. Just that this technology does have the ability to be abused. And you know, it's a lot easier to defend if we're saying, hey, they're out there working hard. They're staying with the dogs. They're they're going you know to new areas. They're taking on these predators on their on their turf. And they're not relying on technology for a kill. When we're defending you, you know, that that's kind of the thing. Is there has to be a line. You can't, I mean, people, it's people see, oh, they turn the dogs out, they sit in the truck, they wait till the, the, the icon goes to the tree, and then they walk in and shoot it. Right. That's happening, but but that's the narrative that we're trying to fight. Yeah, not too long ago. I mean, people could get a call from New York City, you know, from Wyoming or yeah. Western State to somebody sitting in an office in uh, New York city and they fly out and a dog, well, Carl, uh, Carl Boykin just told this story to me that, you know, he's had clients like that, but that was, that was, you know, early eighties type, type hunting. Well, our, our original wording said like when you saw <laughs> a predator, I, I was present at the time the dogs were released, you know, nice. what, what the club wants is you involved in the experience. You're not, you're not an on-call hunter. You're not sitting at the office waiting for, Hey, we've got a hot track. The dogs are on it. Get here as quick as you can. That's, that's not really fair to that animal, you know? Yeah. Um, and we've, we've always been trying to prevent that type of thing. And, you know, to the houndsmen, like, you know, we love you guys. Obviously you're, you're out there doing, doing the predator management that, that the average spot and stock guy can't do. Um, it, we don't, it, it's not that we don't want you on the landscape. We're just defending your, your activities and saying, Hey, you know, from a perception standpoint, don't rely on this technology and we can keep on keeping on. Yeah. And we all, we all know, uh, houndsmen are pretty good about self-regulating, you know, uh, uh, and shunning the guys that are abusing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's, a. Uh, it's, it's one of those deals. We know who those people are that, that, um, never get out of the truck. They, you know, they, it, it we know who you are. We know who you are. So, <laughs> and we got our eye on you. Uh, it, I think the, the, the biggest, 
fly in the ointment for for most houndsmen and the part that we have problems resolving is if it you know it it appears to be a deal where it's like okay you can't use gps tracking equipment um to locate hounds to harvest game but we can use a laser rangefinder we can use a scope we can use uh you know the the latest and greatest uh, uh round and and you know long range some of the long range rifle i'll be shot uh, i'll probably be shot before this comes out but uh you know i go to range day and laying down there behind a, a custom rifle that can spit out a bullet at a thousand yards and hit a six inch i mean even i can lay down behind that rifle and do that zeroed in and that's that's where that's where somehow a lot of my audience looks at it and thinks you know he, we talk about technology but what is all that you know and, and we with long range hunting we we've that's another one that the clubs really looked at um there's not a set distance that we can say don't shoot beyond this uh-huh um, there's, there's people in the East that have never shot over 120 yards and shooting 220 is well outside their capabilities. My yard, I have a 250 yard range and I shoot constantly on that. And so, you know, for some, I mean, so there, there's a line and what, what we've tried to say on, on the technology, again, stretch the stock, not the shot. Um, you know, don't, don't, don't rely on the fact that like, well, my gun can shoot a thousand yards, you know, don't rely on that technology to, to ensure the kill, try to sneak in, try to get a better shot. I mean, you know, that's, that's everything we're trying to say without, you know, we can't just always come in and say, Nope, can't use this. Nope. Can't use this. You, we have to have a very baseline, like this is the very minimum of what fair chase could be. If you want to take it to a higher level, that that's on you and good for you. Yeah. But these bare minimum rules. And so we said, you know, don't, don't harvest an animal at a distance greater than it can detect you. And yeah. apparently that's, that's giving yourself an unfair advantage over the game. It cannot use its senses to detect you at that point, you know, it, you're you're taking unfair advantage now there isn't a set distance for that but you know when you're you know testing your gear and not testing your ability to get in close to that animal mm -hmm. yeah so let's um uh, let's wrap wrap up here and i want to wrap it up be with with this topic you know in 2023 i look out my window and I see deer running across the landscape. You drive down the road, a rainy day like today here in Southeast Indiana, I'm going to see turkeys everywhere. You know, you, you've got, you've got, um, uh, there's a, there's seems, it seems that wildlife is doing very, very well in 2023, uh, and, and as a whole. Um, so, so why does, why is the Boone and Crockett club still relevant and why do people need to support Boone and Crockett in, in 2023? You know, the, the challenges wildlife and wild <laughs> place face today are different, but they're just as strong as they were in our founding. Um, you know, you, you've got emergence of disease, you've got, um, you know, urban sprawl, you've got migration issues there. Wildlife is still, you know, hanging in a delicate balance. And if we just quit, you know, being stewards of them, Things could go horribly wrong, horribly quick. And so, you know, all organizations, I mean, not just Boone and Crockett, but, you know, like to your point, your Houndsman organization, you know, all these people, we need your support and, and to continue this fight. You know, this is this is what we're doing, you know, having these conversations as a, as a whole. How are we going to continue with this robust funding mechanism that is the North American model that are carried by hunters? Somebody's got to be out there showing the value of that system and, you know, it, you go to a wildlife conference, everybody can sit there and criticize what we're doing, but yet nobody, nobody's come up with a better idea yet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's what we do. We, we say where we've been, we take history and we make sure we don't make those mistakes again. And we address new challenges as they come before us. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a never ending battle. It'll go on as long as humans and wildlife exist. That's the number one one of the top things that wildlife managers deal with in 2023 is, is wildlife human conflict and how to resolve those issues, whether, 
whether it be, you know, deer being hit on the road and causing property damage or, or deer causing property damage in crops or, or raccoons in the eaves of somebody's house, you know, it takes up a lot of time. And, and, uh, so there's still a lot of challenges out there for us as hunters, not only to assist wildlife agencies in, in resolving those issues, but making sure that wildlife agencies don't go too far, uh, to, to eliminate wildlife off the landscape and the, the, the policies and regulations are sound for, for the future of wildlife. So Justin, tell us where, uh, people can find information about Boone and Crockett and, uh, how they can get involved. So, like I said, our, our membership is limited to those 100 regular members, but we have a full associate membership, which is a yearly, you know, subscription. You get four issues of our fair chase magazine. Um, the back of it has all the accepted trophies. So there is, there is some, some cool pictures and big antlers and big bears to look at in the back, but it's very, uh, a lot of these topics that the club's working on, we write articles in there. And if you go to our website, um, www.boon-crockett.org or just Google Boone and Crockett, we come right up. Our website's a great starting resource. Um, a lot of our positions are on there. A lot of just overall information that we feel that the, the hunter conservationists could benefit from. And we'd, we'd love your support and, um, you know, any, anything we can do or questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you taking time and I was calling it a, a Boone and Crockett opinion earlier. I'm glad you, I, you caught me there. Uh, it's <laughs> position. Uh, and that's where I found the information that we talked about today about fair chase and GPS, uh, tracking equipment. So, Justin, man, thanks a lot for taking time to uh, go over, give us a history lesson, talk about the value of wildlife management and the important role that Boone and Crock has played in it. I really appreciate it. Uh, but again, appreciate having me on at any time. You know, we're, we're out there trying to work for the hunters too. And so these conversations explaining what we're doing and why we're doing it, I think they, they do a lot of good for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. All right, folks, that's going to wrap it up for this one. Uh, until next time. You follow your hounds and I'll follow mine.